uh, go to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, <clears throat> begin verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for light of the Gentiles. This is speaking, Isaiah is speaking of Christ, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Now, that's my message, out of the prison house. This is the ministry of Christ. Skip over to verse 23, same chapter. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? For who gave Jacob for a spoil and Israel to be robbed to the robbers? Did not the Lord, he against whom you have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, neither were they obedient unto his law. I'm going to talk about prison houses. Look this way, if you will, please. Uh, I'll tell you what. Go to, uh, go to Judges and leave your Bible open at uh, Judges 16, the 16th chapter of Judges. I'm going to be speaking from that book of Judges this morning, but I want you to uh, leave it open there on your lap and we'll be going back to it. Before we do that, let me bring you up to date <clears throat> on some things. Some of you may know my wife and I and uh, some of our group are moving in three weeks to New York City. We're purchasing a theater near Times Square and going back to start a witness for Jesus and right off of 42nd Street in Times Square. But that city has gone absolutely insane. There's a new drug crack that's on the street, but there's another one. It's called fentanyl, and fentanyl is two to 6,000 times more powerful than crack. And just one shot is a lifetime addiction. There are probably 1,000 doctors already uh, hooked on it. 20% of all the junkies in California are already hooked on it. It's spreading like a fire through New York City. <clears throat> There's a, a, a new analog of it called uh, Sufentanil, Lofentanil, and these are designer drugs that are so powerful that you can put $1 billion worth in a shoebox. $1 billion. That's a medical journal states it right here. Uh, this is incredible what's happening. How do you describe the society that we're in right now? The violence, the drugs, the parents now who live in terror. And the reason I want to discuss this with you, you're going to go out in the ministry, and you're going to fight it just like I'm fighting it. If you're going to go into a mid-city, especially, if you're going to go in the inner city, I want you to know some things this morning that I've learned after some 32 years of working with troubled young people. You know, Jesus, when the women were following him, weeping. He said, women, don't, look, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself and weep for your children. And I weep for these children. When I'm on the streets of New York, especially this past year, so many mothers would bring their babies up and say, please, and most of them Catholic background, bless my child. I want one to make it. I've got a 16-year-old girl that's a prostitute. I've got a 15-year-old boy in jail for possession and sale of narcotics. I want one to make it, just one. And you hear the weeping. 32 children have either fallen or been thrown out of high rises. This past summer, uh, a father, 21 years old, hung his two-month baby out the window by the arm and then the finger before they were able to rescue the child. Many of them thrown out to their death. One uncle threw his eight-year-old nephew out and killed him from the 32nd floor. And the prophet Isaiah said, this is for a time to come. People are going to be locked in prison houses. For those who will hear it, those who will listen, it's a time to weep. It's a time to weep for college students all over America who have blown their minds on drugs. You go to 42nd Street today, <clears throat> about 9 o'clock this evening, and you go from 7th Avenue to 8th Avenue and listen to the commercial that pushers have for the sale of drugs. Hey, I've got the stuff that killed Len Bias. They're selling death. There's no more fear of death. You pull to a traffic light and you watch 15, 60-year-old kids who were once so tender, so loving of their parents, jump out and put a gun to the window and hold up everybody in the car and they mean it when they shall blow your head off. You talk to a mother who says, I live in constant fear and her 70-year-old son she brought to one of my meetings sat right in the front seat, a young genius, a college student, who has told her, I'm designing a plan to kill you 
He's so crazed on crack. I'm going to kill you, but nobody will know it. And she lives under constant fear. She's, he's tried to poison her twice. Isaiah the prophet said, who among you will give ear? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? We are headed for a chemical society. We have preachers hooked on drugs now all over the United States. You know, you, we, we listen to the AIDS problem not knowing. I heard a doctor the other day say it's all over. He, he was convinced it's all over because for the first time in history, we have a situation where politically we have and spiritually we have no moral or political uh, courage left to stop this plague. It's going to be worse than the bubonic plague of the fourth century. It's going to be worse than the black plague of 1346 and, seven, and also in 1656. These black plagues, the bubonic plagues that killed in some nations half the population, these doctors say it's going to get worse. And we don't have the courage to even call it by its original name. It was originally called GRID, Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. And the homosexual society is so embedded in our system now, they had it called this innocuous thing called AIDS. And it's really not a syndrome, it's a disease. There's no moral courage left. And the prophet said, who among you will give ear? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? He was speaking of our time. But this is now a people robbed and spoiled. They're snared in holes. They're hid in prison houses and for a prey with no one to deliver them. And they're for a spoil. No one says, give them back. Give them back. It's enough. Now, I want to go into the word of God with you now because I... I could get into the statistics, I could sit here and paint a picture for you without getting into the exotics of it and tell you that without, I wonder right now if our wound isn't incurable. Now the, the, the reconstructionists and the kingdom uh, dominion people say, well that's just the problem with you uh, rapture people, you're looking for escape, you don't want to deal with the problems. Well, excuse me if I want to be like Abraham and say, I have no continuing city here, but I look for a city whose builder maker is God. But you see, there are some Bible principles, there are some Bible truths here that we've got to deal with. Mrs. Reagan, and, and I, I love our president, and I pray for our president and his wife, but she says the answer is education. So, so now millions and millions of dollars are going to be expended on drug education. We're going to try to educate it. And now they just say, just say no. And the whole uh, homosexual community, the whole drug community laughs at it. Just say no. As if that's all there was to it. Just say no. All right, let's go to the Bible. I don't want to talk about it because you go on the streets, you're going to deal with this. They take it from somebody who's been at it for a long, long time. And this, this has to do not with not only drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, masturbation, any one of these problems that come against you and take a root, they've got to be dealt with. You cannot be a man or woman of God and carry any of this baggage. There has to be full deliverance. There has to be a certain sound go out in this dark age, and that certain sound only comes from those whose hearts are pure before God. If you have a divided heart, you're going to blow a trumpet that doesn't sound clearly. And the only thing that people are going to respond to now is a clear sound. All right, let's go to the story of Samson. Uh, start with Judges 13. Judges 13. I want to show you the beginning of this man of God, and then I want to show you this end, and then let's talk about these problems of how, uh, how people disintegrate morally, especially in the ministry. Judges 13, verse 24. Verse 24, speaking of the birth of Samson. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Estel. Now, does it say in your Bible that the Spirit of God was on him? How many see it? The Spirit of God was on him from his birth. All right, now I want you to go to uh, Judges 16. Skip over Judges 16 and look at verse 21. I'll show you the end of this man who had the Holy Ghost upon him. The Lord had been with him, but look at verse 21 of verse chapter 16. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, that means he lost all his discernment, and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Now just leave Judges 16 open on your lap because I'm going to refer to it, and I want you to follow me. Samson's downfall is our 
his bondage and his downfall is our example. Don't turn there, but 1 Corinthians 10, 15. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples, and they're written for our instructions upon whom the ends of the world are come. And what he's saying, don't listen to the experts. Don't listen to, the, to the, those who, who, who tell you that psychology is the answer. He says, go to the Word of God. The examples are in the Word of God. There are your answers. There are examples upon whom the end of the world has come. We are those upon whom the end of the world is coming. He says, go, find the example, learn from it. Let's learn from it right now. I want to name a few uh, of these things that happened to Samson. First of all, I want you to know that all the education and all the knowledge and even a spiritual upbringing cannot save you from the power of sin. can save nobody from the power of sin. Nobody was raised with a more godly background than Samson. He was a Nazarite. He'd taken a Nazarite vow. It means he was educated and trained to avoid any contact with anything that was evil or corrupt. He couldn't touch leaven. He couldn't even go to the funeral of any member of his family lest he dare touch the corpse or anything that touched it. He was trained not to touch alcohol of any kind. He could not drink. He was to be totally separated under God, separated from everything connected with death or sin. From his childhood, and by the way, an angel came and taught his parents how to raise him. Now, how would you like to be raised under angelic instructions? An angel gave his parents vivid instructions on how he was to be raised. He was raised right out of God's throne. He was warned of the dangers of mixing. He was warned of the dangers of mixing with the wicked crowd. He knew what that meant from childhood. You don't mix. You don't mix with the Philistine crowd. No man had this pounded into him more. No more, no young man was more clearly warned of the dangers of this syncretism. The Spirit of God had instructed him to be separate and clean. But there's something in Samson that arose. There was a strange boredom. There was a strange curiosity. And you see it everywhere you go in America today, this strange intrigue with mysterious. You, you, suddenly in the life of Samson, you see a scripture verse that makes no sense at all. In the middle of this training, and God's spirit being upon him, he's now a judge in Israel. He's a man of God, loved and respected. A man who has all the knowledge. A man who has the word of God. He knew the law of Moses. He knew the law, trained in the law. Then how do you explain 16 verse 1? Look at it. How do you explain this? Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went into her. Now look at me. In one sudden rage, in one sudden pull of the enemy, this man blows all of his education, all of the warnings about mingling, all the years of training, it all goes up in smoke in one stubborn act of rebellion. All his past years of precise knowledge couldn't help him. There was a boredom in this man. There's a seed of rebellion in him. And the re Bible says rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, and it can bring about a demonic spell. And you know Satan's chief you know, his first attack on you is this. Relax. Serving God can't be that difficult. Serving God is not that intense. You know the problem in the church of Jesus Christ today and in many pulpits today? It's They've turned this sober, holy matter of walking with God into fun. I was in one of the largest charismatic churches in America. I was curious. I went incognito and I just sat in the back with another minister. I said, I want to know what's attracting all these thousands of people. Quote, one of the fastest growing churches in America. One of thousands. Fastest growing churches in America. We must have 2,000 fastest growing churches in America. Horrible thing in the sight of God. And I sat there and, and, and the preacher preached his you know, five P's or five Q's all in line. 
and, and I, I went out and I turned to my very godly man who was with me and I said, tell me what I'm feeling. I said, what's the word? And we both said it. It was fun. No conviction. It was fun. Relax. And this is the message in the church today. Relax. It can't be that intense. Don't be. There was a Pentecostal Assembly of God man in, Pe uh, forgive me, the state, but in the East. Just held a sectional meeting, Assemblies of God, and the subject was why holiness preaching produces kooks. Why holiness preaching produces kooks. And the cry is, relax, don't put guilt trips on people. Oh, to God, this man had a guilt trip on him. You know, it's important to know the dangers to be educated. But you know, most teenagers know, you go to New York City. They've heard it over and over again. Literature's been passed out. They know that her heroin won't do it, but crack will do it to the brain. It's called a substance called dopamine. And it's just like the skull opens up, the brain opens up, and the dopamine escapes. Dopamine is that thing in the brain that causes a sense of equilibrium. It keeps, from de keeps you from depression. But that escapes, and it's not repeated in the brain after crack. And so there's constant paranoia. There's constant depression. That's why they want to kick their feet through television set. Why you don't, on a subway, laugh at anything. They'll think you're laughing at them. They'll put a fist in your face because there's permanent paranoia. The dopamines escape from the brain. They know it, but it makes no sense. They know that Elvis Presley died of an overdose. They see Len Bias go down. They see all these things. It makes no difference once the heart is set on relaxing, once the heart is set on the intrigue of this world. Nothing can stop it. I believe television is the mother of boredom. Secular television is dry breast. Some of you young people sucking from these dry breasts of the world. Just a little fun, just a little relaxation. There are some of you students here more interested in sports than you are in the Word of God. Why don't you go to another college where they give you all sports? If you're here, it is something that's intense. There is a joy of the Lord. I heard someone say, David Wilkinson, I've known him 20 years, never seen him smile. Listen, I've got a joy that nobody in the world can take from me. It's a joy from walking in his presence and knowing him and knowing that I could walk before this world in holiness. I have not arrived. The Holy Ghost is dealing with me this past week on things I never knew were in my heart. I wept for three days recently over something the Lord showed me. The Bible said they're proud and boastful inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. And all they, they know, they know the ordinance of God that those who practice these things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also give healthy approval to those who practice them. Now you see, once the mind is set on experimentation, knowing the dangers won't stop anybody. The Bible said the sluggard or the lazy one is wiser in his own conceit than seven men who can give him a reason. In other words, you can have seven men, seven experts go to this one who's intent. He's got something in his mind. He's experimenting. He's got this intrigue, this strange pull. He's got a besetting sin he won't lay down. Seven men with a good reason. All the Bible scholars, seven godly theologians could sit down and they still won't persuade him out of his sin. Recently in California, and I know this to be a fact and I'm not gossiping, pastor of a very large independent church, was, it was in the newspapers, his prom promiscuity and his affairs, and three or four very well-known godly men went to see him. And he asked them to leave the office. They couldn't touch him. His mind had been set. And you see, the, here's the, the next thing. First of all, all the Bible knowledge in the world, all the secular knowledge will not keep you from the power of sin. And secondly, the first encounter with the forbidden is the most dangerous. Mostly because it almost always works. The first encounter is the most dangerous because it usually works. <clears throat> you can usually breeze right through it without any apparent harm to anybody. And you can escape. And the devil allowed this to let you escape with memories of ecstasy, 
thrills and tremendous pleasure. This is the way it was with Samson. He has his fling with this harlot. And he looks out the window and he sees trouble because the Philistines have gathered around him. And I know because I've seen something of human nature. I know because the Holy Ghost still was on this man. There must have been a sword go through him. Oh, no, I'm caught, red-handed. I'm going to be exposed. That's what I'd been taught. Be sure your sin will find you out. And he's, I know his mind is racing in prayer. God, get me out of this. I'll never do it again. So help me. Oh, God, get me out. I'll never. And there's fear on him. And God does just that. He puts the Philistines to sleep. And Samson waited till midnight. And at midnight he arose and took the doors of the gate of the city. It's in verse 3. And the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that's before he, Hebron. Can you see him go in front of that gate that's locked? And he said, oh, God, your spirit's still on me. I failed you. Forgive me. I'll never do it again. It's a slip. Moment of weakness. I hate it. Lord, I'll never do it again. And he looks at that and says in the name of my heavenly father, and he lifts those gates. He puts them on his back. And all the way up that hill, he said, I'll show the devil he can't touch me. I'll show the devil I'm not bound by this thing. But I want you to know something. That whole act of taking that, here's what sin will do to you. That whole thing of taking up this gate and taking it to the top of the mountain, it's all theatrics. Nothing is accomplished for the kingdom of God. It's all theater. And that, tragically, young people, is what we're seeing in the house of God. We're seeing theater. We're seeing theatrics. It's because God's putting his finger on sin, and there's only a half surrender. There's still the pull, the tug of the world. And men who still have a trace of the anointing are standing there and because people don't have discernment, they don't know the difference. It's theatrics. Aren't there supposed to be regrets? In the next day, you're supposed to say, oh, God, I feel, I feel the terror of my sin. I hate it. But you see, his parents don't find out. Israel doesn't find out. It's all covered. It's almost as though God. It's just, it's all over. God's forgiven. Nobody knows about it. You know what the Bible says? Because judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of man is fully set in them to do evil. Now, you know, it'd be great, wouldn't it, if every time we got down into the devil's pit and committed some awful sin in the sight of God that there'd be instant judgment. Any of us could walk with God then. But we're to have in us the kind of fear of God that though we don't see speedy judgment on our sins, we've grieved our holy God and it's our love that should cause the grief. Do you believe that? But there's no apparent judgment and that's the way it is with drugs. You know, you go tell kids, hey, you, you try crack, it'll kill you. Most of the times it doesn't the first time. Most of the times the devil will let it be a great success and all that. All they're left is memories of ecstasy. One doctor in this article says, I took one shot of fentanyl and the next day I missed it. I missed it. I wanted it. I yearned for it. Though it was a long lost friend, a doctor. Who would know more about the dangers of drugs than doctors, and yet hundreds are getting hooked? If education is the answer, explain that. But you see, at this point, something terrible is happening. The mind is being set, confirmed. David said transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes, for it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discoveries of iniquity and the hatred of it, the words of his mouth of wickedness and deceit. He ceased to do wise now and to do good. 
And now he plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that's not good. He no longer despises evil. Oh, the moment you come, the moment you arrive at a place in your spiritual life that you don't hate that thing in your life, that besetting sin. Listen, God is so patient with those who hate sin. You may be struggling with something. Now there comes a time he'll give you a loving ultimatum and say, this is it. If you don't lay it down, I'm going to have to turn you over to the power of it until my judgment can work grace in you. And I believe in the awesome judgments of God against sin. But how patient he is with those who hate their lust and they'll fight it and say, I will not give in to this. And they seek the face of God. But you see, this man now doesn't hate it. All he's doing is playing within his mind. He's, he's replaying it, replaying it. If you came out of some kind of sin like this and you lay at night and you replay your sins, you're playing a very dangerous game because in that process you're going to lose the hatred for it. You'll lose the hatred of that thing and you'll be fully set to do it again. So here he is on his bed at night and he's saying, one more time. One more time, that's all. One more time. I've got to get it out of my system. It's still there. And the only way to defeat this thing is to do it one more time, and I'll hate it then. And those, here's my third truth, those who set themselves to do their evil are going to be possessed and driven by a demonic power. Because when you say one more time, that's when you give ground to demonic spirits. And Satan's goal is to break down this man of God in his strength, his spiritual strength and his resistance to resist sin. One more time. And now, this is incredible. Came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now you look up the Hebrew word of the name Delilah and it's very, very uh, enlightening. Delilah means, here's, here's, her name, because in Hebrew, they were named after characteristics. Slacken up. Loosen up. Don't come under bondage. And it means empty, dry, emaciated. It's all there. Get a strong concordance. That's all you need. Look it up. And so here he is now. One more time. And the call is loosen up. Loosen up. She embodies demonic lust, that tool of Satan, to get us to just loose, loosen up, relax. Listen to it now. Judges 16, 5, verse 5. And the lords of the Philistines came unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see where in his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of his 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, look at me and listen closely. We are living in a day, and you see it right here, where the devil doesn't come in the back door. The, one, the moment you say one more time, the moment you give him a foot, he's not even going to try to hide his ambitions. He's not even going to try to hide what he wants to do to you. He'll scream it in your face. He'll mock you with it. It's, it's almost incredible Look at, look at 6. Delilah says to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and where thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. L look at verse 3 times now. Look at verse 10. Delilah said to Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me, Lionel, tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And then you see it again in verse 13 at the end. Uh, tell me, wherein thou mightest be bound. You know what she's saying? I'm going to, she's right up front with it, the devil's right up front. I'm going to bind you and I'm going to afflict you. I'm going to kill you. Now, the first time she said that, what, what, what is there in this man? What's happened to him that he can't recognize, that he can't hear the devil saying right to his face, I'm going to bring you down. 
This is going to destroy you. What's happened? Tell me where in your great strength is, how I may bind you to afflict you. This man is not in control. He's been driven. He goes once. Listen, the first time she said that should have been enough. She sh he should have said, that's the devil. I'm a man of God. The devil's out to destroy me. You know, Samson, just like so many Christians, say, well, I'm different. Or, they, or, or they'll buy into a doctrine of false security. This false security that's going around now that says that you only sin in your flesh and your spirit's intact. That you can do what you want with your body, and as long as your spirit's reaching out to God, you're safe. It's a doctrine of demons that's spreading the whole charismatic movement today. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Bible talks about the filthiness of the spirit as well as the flesh. Now hear me and hear me good. The devil's not hiding his message to some of you here right now. This is loud and clear. If you've, you've got that hidden thing, if you've got a sin in your heart that's hidden, and you've been covering it up, and you can go to Bible school a whole year, and you can cover it and cover it and cover it, and already the devil's made it clear to you it's not only the warning of the Holy Ghost, it's the devil himself said, I'm going to bring you down. It's going to get you. It's going to expose you and bring you down. Samson said, run. There should have been some of the fear of God said, that's enough. There was an ultimatum. God was giving him ultimatum. Through the very voice of the devil himself, he heard the ultimatum ringing from heaven to hell. This is the end, Samson. If you continue, if you don't lay it down, it's going to cost you everything. He's no longer in control. The Bible said the wicked is driven away by his wickedness. Proverbs 14, 32. Jeremiah said, In my house I found wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their ways shall be unto them a slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall. They'll be driven by their sins. He said to backslidden Israel, Israel's, a sc Israel's now scattered sheep. The lions have driven them away. The lion being the roaring lion, Satan himself. But you see, before the devil can really take over and take full possession, there's one thing that he has to accomplish. And it's the only hope for those who are bound by lust or sin. He has to win your heart. As long as there's something in you that cries out to God, there's hope. I, I remember two junkies up on a rooftop in Brooklyn. They'd walked out of Teen Challenge, and they were both just taking a shot. And they were sitting over on the edge of this rooftop, hidden under the, the alcove of the roof. And they were crying. And where's this effect? Brother Dave, we've sinned, but don't give up on us. And they were crying. We still want God. Don't give up, God. There was a cry in their heart. They hated their sin. And there was still a cry. The devil had succeeded moving in. The devil had told me he's trying to destroy them. And yet, the devil didn't have all the heart. The heart still had a cry. And they'll come what is called, the Bible calls a vexing hour. And then she said to him, well, look at Judges 16, verses 15. And she said unto him, how canst thou say, I love thee? When thine heart, your heart is not with me. You've mocked me these three times. You've not told me where in thy great strength lieth. Came to pass when she pressed him, and in Hebrew it's vexed him, pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. There you have it. That's the vexing hour. She said, you've lied to me now. I want to know. And the devil vexed him. And Samson, in this vexing hour, gives his heart to Delilah. The Bible said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And I want to tell you, I want to show you how important it is to hold to your heart. How important it is to let the Holy Ghost give you the ultimatum.
and receive it and forsake every besetting sin and lay down every lust. Because you see, it's not a matter of exposure now. Oh, listen, just to be exposed before your friends, that's not the problem. That's what most people fear. I'm going to be exposed and people know what I really am. No, to be exposed before man is nothing. The real terror of it is the loss of discernment. The loss of discernment to become so blind and not know it. And they took him, verse 21, and they took him and put his eyes out. What does that mean to you in a spiritual context? They robbed him. The devil took away his discernment. And when you play with sin, that's the first thing that goes. Your spiritual discernment. You can't discern when a man is in the spirit or in the flesh. You can't tell when you're in the spirit or the flesh. And now the spirit of God has departed. You know, a preacher once said, Whenever anybody reproves me, I always ask myself the question, is he right in reproving me? But that's not the question. The dear brother missed it completely. The question is, is there some compromise in my life that has caused me to lose my discernment and I don't know when I'm being reproved righteously? And I miss it. Nothing could be worse than to be reproved by the Holy Ghost and not accept it because you're not aware of your sin, because you've lost your discernment. And by the way, the first thing God gives you back when you repent and walk in holiness is the discernment of the Holy Ghost. Oh, do we need that in these last days? We need that discernment. They put his eyes out. The devil made fun of Samson in his blindness. The lords of the Philistines assembled to offer great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and rejoiced. For they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Isn't that a sad thing that the enemies of God rejoice? This is what bothers me about so much of Christian television today. It's so sacrilegious they call the enemies of God to mock and ridicule. And say, that's Jesus? Is that what represents Jesus? Carnival Christianity? It's a carnival. If you don't weep over it, then you don't know God. We'd be on our, we should be on our face. So it happened that then they were in high spirit. They said, call for Samson. He may amuse us. Can you imagine a man of God reduced to amusing people? Go to Ezekiel 44 and I'll show it to you. Ezekiel 44. I want, I want to show you these kind of ministries that have been reduced to amusing people. Ezekiel 44. Look, look, at, uh, look at verse 5. The Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well and behold with thine eyes and hear with thine ears all that I say unto thee concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering in of the house with every going forth. In other words, mark the exits and the entrances of the house of God. Do you know that's the problem? Look at me now. There's a ministry reduced to amusement now that perverts the entrances and hides the exits of the house of God. They don't know how to bring people into the fullness of Jesus Christ. And then when people are out into error, they don't even know how to bring them back. Perverting the entrances and hiding the exits. You want to see how bad it gets? Look at verse 6. And thou shalt say the rebellious, even the house of Israel, thus said the Lord God, your house of Israel, let it suffice of you all your abominations. And the Hebrew, Hebrew but says, enough of all your abominations. In that you brought into my sanctuary strangers. You're putting in your pulpit strangers to me. You're allowing many God to stand in your holy pulpits that are strangers to a holy God. 
uncircumcised in heart and flesh to be in my sanctuary to pollute it, even my house. When you offer my bread and the fat and blood, they've broken my covenant because of your abomination. You've not kept charge of my holy things, but you've set keepers in my house and my sanctuary for yourself. Look at verse 10. And the Levites that are gone away far. They're idols. They shall bear their iniquities. Yeah, look at this. Now look, look at me. Look me in the face a minute, young people. Look at me. Listen to what the prophet Ezekiel is saying. There's coming a day when there are going to be men, and this is why we need discernment. There are going to be men that put strangers in the pulpit. He's, one of the prophets said they're going to cover my table with vomit. They're going to set in my house strangers, workers of iniquity. He said they're going to hide, pervert the entrances and hide the exits. And he said they're going to have idols in their heart. But look at verse 11. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house. Who's in charge? The amusement people. Those reduced to amusing people because they've lost their eyes. They shall slay the burnt offering of the sacrifice of the people. And they shall stand before them to minister to them. You know, the people don't even know the difference. There he is up there going through all the motions and nobody knows the difference. They can't even, they've lost the discernment. I'm not mad at any human being on the face of There's not a preacher in America that I don't love as a human being. The Bible said if he's walking in error, I don't even dare bid him Godspeed lest I be a partaker of his sins. Look at verse 12. Because they ministered unto them before their idols. Can you imagine that? These men had idols in their heart. These Levites had idols and, because, and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. The, the ministry is calling, causing Israel to fall into iniquity. The Levites, those who are ministering in the house at the altar, are causing God's people to fall into sin. Is it in your Bible? Look at it. Therefore I have lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear the iniquity. And look at verse 13. And they shall not come near unto me to do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most of holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abomination which they have committed, and the shame is the loss of the anointing. But look at verse 14. If this doesn't make you weep, every, every teacher and every pastor, listen to me now. If that next verse doesn't make you and me weep, we have lost the touch of God in our souls. Look at that. That should make us weep. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house. Who? Men with idols, causing Israel to go astray. I'll permit them, because he said, the congregation have idols in their heart. I'll raise up preachers to minister to those idols. You show me a congregation begins to seek the face of God, and they can pray out any preacher that's not seeking God, and God will raise up a shepherd after his own heart. For all the service thereof, and for all that shall be done therein, but look at the next verse. Hallelujah. But the priest, of, but the priest, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, this is the holy ministry, that kept the charge of my sanctuary. When the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer blood and fat and sacrifice. They shall enter my sanctuary. They shall come near to my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. God has his men. Hallelujah. God has his college students. The more wicked the day gets, the more holy his servants have to be. To stand out in bold relief against the iniquity. But there has to be discernment. The only, play, the only way God can give you discernment and let you keep it is to walk in righteousness. Having laid down your sins. Uh, I'm going to have to close because the time is running out. But uh, Look at this man. Right to the last. Samson... Samson is not concerned about the righteousness of God to his dying day. He's concerned. He, he is so gone. 
so far from God. He has so lost the anointing that all he has in his dying day is revenge. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, God, please remember me and please strengthen me just one more time that I may be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. He's still not thinking of God's holiness. That man died full of revenge. And all people say he had the greatest victory when he died. No. Oh, he killed a lot of Philistines. Yes, the Bible says that he, he, he accomplished more as far as killing in his death more than those who had killed in his life. But what about God's man? What about God's man? I take it seriously, young people, when I read in the Bible that God wouldn't let Moses go into the promised land because he didn't. He made God appear less holy before the eyes of the people than he was. He made God appear less holy than he was. And I fear that. I tremble at that. I tremble a man of the stature of a Samson, born and raised as he was, and so full of the Holy Spirit. I tremble. I don't take this thing lightly. I don't know. I know some very precious men of God. And they're the men under whom I sit and be reproved. I've got men that reprove me solidly. And by the way, I'll tell you something. I, I've heard people say, uh, where does Jimmy Swagger get his right to reprove? If somebody's a god or a preacher or anybody else. I'll tell you where you get that right because he sits and takes it. I've sent some very strong three praise letters of reproof to Brother Swagger. And he's received it. And he's reproved me and I've received it. He's got godly men around who are not yes men and they know they have a right to go and say Brother Swagger, here's what God's saying to me and I want you to listen and Brother Swagger listens if it's not of God, he'll just accept it and move on do what God tells him to do young people in these days you're not going to know, there's so many strange doctrines, cults, so many Men are going to come sounding so good, looking so pious. And that often would sound so pious and look so religious and abomination in the sight of God. And if you don't have discernment, you're not going to know it. You're going to be led astray. And nobody in the world can give you that discernment. It's going to come. I said, oh God, I will not permit in my life anything, anything unlike you. Jesus, deal with the sin. And he'll come and he'll give you a loving ultimatum and says, all right, you've got to deal with it now. I've got to take away my anointing. I've got to lift my spirit from you. I have to remove all discernment from you. And when that happens, the only thing left for you is a minister of revenge with no anointing. And every victory you have from then on will be in the flesh. Now, I, I didn't, I just obeyed God what he told me to preach this morning. <clears throat> Not trying to come here and sweep you into some kind of great conviction. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say one last thing to you before I have to leave. The Lord's cleaning up his house. He's bringing forth the holy remnant. And judgment's already at the door. America's already under judgment. Age is judgment. We're living under extreme divine judgment right now. It's all winding down. He's saying all these things are going to be dissolved with fervent heat. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation before God? How should we be walking? There's nothing wrong with sports, but keep that in its place. Keep it in its place. If it's got you bound, you better walk away from it. Whatever it is, stand between you, the sober looking at your heart. Otherwise, 
you'll sit under preachers just like this this morning and you'll rebel against it saying, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to that kind of thing. And the time will come that, that you'll think uh, Jimmy Swaggart or preachers of that caliber are just men of harassment. You'll say, I don't want to hear it anymore. You'll walk away from it and you'll find yourself a message that'll soothe you. Will you not be convicted of your sins? Let's stand. Is there a hunger in your heart this morning? There's something crying out in you, oh God, in these days of darkness, in this day when people are just giving themselves over their sins. I want to stand before clean hands and a pure heart. That's where the joy of the Lord comes from. You don't have to choreograph for anything when you've got the purity in your heart. The joy comes out of a pure fountain. <laughs> I've danced more in the past year than I've danced in all my lifetime. I've danced everywhere in meetings where the glory of God came down because of the joy of the Lord in my heart. You can't choreograph for that. <laughs> glory be to God. There's, I'll tell you what. If you don't have the joy of the Lord in your heart right now, it's because God's dealing with sin. If there's not a shout in you right now, after I've preached, there's something wrong. If you say, Bo Wilkes, I've got a habit, I've got lust in my heart, and I won't be delivered. Nobody going to put a microphone under you. Nobody going to say anything stupid or silly to you. Come and stand here right now. And let's ask for deliverance. Nobody needs to know. Don't confess it to anybody but the Lord. You stand up here and say, I want deliverance. I've got to be delivered. And I'm, I've heard the ultimatum of the Holy Ghost this morning, and I want to be free right now. Not a sound from anybody. You don't have to confess it to anyone else but the Lord right now. Come on. Maybe some past sin that's haunted you and you've just been replaying it in your mind. Come on, lay it down. Move in close. I'm not trying to build a number here. I've got to leave in just a moment, but I want to pray for all of you. Raise both hands. You're standing here now. Listen, I believe God sees your heart right now. I believe he sees that, that cry. Will you let the Holy Ghost give you a loving ultimatum? Will you let the Holy Ghost say, enough, enough, enough? God says, enough, enough. This is it. It's enough. You must lay it down now. Let the fear of God grip your heart. Let the fear of the Lord grip your heart. There has to be the fear of God. Uh, the dread of God. An awe of God's holiness. Heavenly Father, send deliverance right now. We bind the devil. We bind satanic powers. We bind the lying spirits of Satan. Let's everyone raise their hand. Lord, we claim power in Jesus' name. Every ever lust that comes against this flesh. We call on you, Lord, to give us discernment against evil doctrine, discernment against sin. My God, now, turn the searchlight on our hearts that we will not walk like Samson. We will walk in righteousness before you, Jesus. We will walk in your holiness. We will walk before you circumspect. While you're standing there right now, ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment right now. Lord, give me discernment. Let me discern it. Let me know it. Hallelujah. And the moment you know, then you begin to rejoice and thank Him. Just begin to thank Him. Hallelujah. Let Him deal with it. Let Him deal with it. God's faithful. He hears it. Oh, Lord, you see the cry of hearts and you're so faithful. You're so loving. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.